<laughs> Thank you, Mo. Um, yeah, as an organizer, definitely, uh, definitely do not want this kind of thing happen. But as a researcher, I think it's really an honor for me to share of, uh, some of our recent work on uh, cell phenotypic uh, transitions. Um, so I have been always puzzled by this problem that uh, um, mammalian cells, they can exist in, in different cell types with very distinct physical, chemical, and biological properties. And amazingly, they all come a single fertilizer egg. So cells can exist in different cell types that they can convert between them. Like uh, during the embryo development, you see this uh, 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 epithelial to massive hemotransition, those uh, tightly bound epithelial cells will convert to this uh, loosely bound mobile massive chemo cells. Um, but unfortunately, this process also can be hijacked by a process like uh, metastasis, um, fibrosis. Another example is this cell reprogramming. So reprogram, uh, we can reprogram terminally differentiated cells like fibroblast into induced pluripotent stem cells, then differentiate into other cell types, or di directly trans-differentiate one cell type to another one. So all this raises the question is, uh, how do cells regulate phenotypes and how we can control cell phenotypes? Um, so here, I'll show you an example. This is human A549 cells undergoing EMT uh, when treated with TGI beta. So you see, and the DIC channel, cells change uh, shape dramatically. And this one is the um, uh, Mamington, well, as Hava just also showed in, in her talk, uh, this is intermediate filament. So we see this is a Mamington expression and the tech, um, distribution of the change during the process. So this is typically how. Um, how a biologist will describe this process. But for physicists, this is the language, right? We have a governing equation, like see we have F, uh, well, X is some dynamic variable, which will specify later, and F describe their interactions, and Z the some noise terms. So this can describe how the system evolve over time. So the dynamical system theory will tell us a stable phenotype can be viewed as a tractor in this uh, high dimensional state space, um, and then, um, so when you have phenotype change, you have destabilized this phenotype. So there are several basic mechanisms. One, one is shown in this uh, very famous Waddington landscape. So you see initially cell have a stable phenotype. Um, so here I just use, um, use a landscape as potential to act kind of illustrate the process, okay? So when the uh, uh, environment change, then you see the attract getting flatter and flatter. Um, so uh, um, exceeding a critical point, then the original uh, attractor destabilize and the new attractor appears. So this is a pitchfork bifurcation. Uh, Well-known example in physics is uh, like a Landau theory of uh, critical phenomena. So another example uh, ma uh, mechanism is a saddle knot bifurcation. So where you also have original have attractor, then the first thing is a, a new attractor appears, the two attractors separated by a set of points. Then when the, uh, uh, the you know, control variable change, the, the set of points approaching the original attractor eventually collide. So destabilize this original attractor and system relax the new attractor. So this is a side of bifurcation. Here I show you example, uh, oops, I don't know, hold on, just one minute. Yeah, something wrong with the uh, transition. So let's see. Yeah, so this is an a, a, a example of cell not bifurcation in chemistry. I, I noticed no one has really talked about this uh, in, in the context of not bifurcation. So this is a Rudy Marcus uh, HR transfer theory. So when so you have a donor, you have an acceptor, I learned transfer from a donor acceptor. So we describe it as this, you have reaction coordinates. So this reaction coordinate describes the progression of a chemical reaction. Uh, so you originally have uh, um, this is uh, the harmonic potential represent uh, the uh, reactant, and this harmonic potential represent the product uh, free end profile. So you do cross the point. So see the bottom as the external dynamic driving force, uh, and then uh, you also have this uh, uh, this barrier, right? That's connected barrier. So this, uh, if you if you increase uh, the driving force, then you see this cross point 
uh, move this way, if I get across with this original set of points, then it becomes a barrierless relaxation. But you further increase, you got new uh, attract, new new uh, barrier. So this is the Max inversion uh, region. Um, so so this is an example. So there we see um, if we want to uh, study uh, cell phenotype transition. Means you see, we have to have a mathematical representation. We need to describe what's the coordinate. So here I talk about we want to use life cycle imaging to trace individual cells. So here we have limitation now what how we can choose because we need to choose the right one that can reflect the course of the transformation and also should be easily measurable. And remember, we are talking about cells, live cells, and we need to trace them. You know, the transition process that will happen in days, weeks. So we need continuous imaging, we need the minimal intrusion, minimal damage to cells. So one first choice will be you have a fused uh, fluorescent protein to, 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 uh, to a certain uh, molecular spaces. So actually my lab spent several years trying to, uh, we work out an efficient way for CRISPR uh, not be in. But you know, there are a lot of limitations and a lot of concerns. Then we realize another uh, thing we can do is uh, um, cell morphological features here. Um, it's a general term. I mean, really anything that can easily, we can observe even just with transmission light microscope or some uh, simple staining or labeling. So we know uh, cell phenotype transition typically um, accompany a large cell morphological change. And this uh, cell morphological feature actually has already been typically uh, routinely used in pathology and in cell phenotyping. But there is a fundamental different conceptual difference here is that we use those collective features as dynamical variable rather than just the statistical quantities. And even from a uh, statistical physics, uh, condensed matter physics perspective, you see here cell morphological features, some collective uh, uh, variable, collective uh, 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 um, degree freedom. And this is natural for us, right? Because uh, when we describe system, we can either trace individual particles or have this collective uh, variables. So now you have a lot of image. First, you need segment cells. So um, then this way develop a deep learning uh, based uh, math uh, algorithm. So been published, I won't go to in the detail. Um, then we need to quantify uh, the image. To do is uh, we first segment the cells. Then we use this active shape model from uh, computer vision uh, to digitize the, uh, the information. So there's a, we have a cell morphology. We place uh, N particles, well, uniformly along the periphery. So each particle has uh, X, Y coordinates. Let's say talk about 2D image, right? So now um, we can use a, two, a, a point in this 2N dimensional shape space represent this shape. So we can do further some principal mode analysis. So got this uh, a set of, uh, um, complete orthonormal basis function. So any shape can be represented a linear combination of this uh, uh, basis function. So a cell uh, will uh, um, trace a, in a trajectory in this phase space. Now you see the language becomes something we are very familiar with. So you see for uh, this uh, if I for that EMT, we have morphology quantified by the active shape model for the Vimington, uh, both expression and texture features. We use this called heraldic features to quantify them. So we have this uh, you know, uh, composite high dimensional cell feature space. Then the procedure will be like this. First, we do time-lapse imaging with the DIC channel and the fluorescent channel. And then we segment the cells and the trace individual cells trajectories. But then we um, extract those features, both morphology and many features represent in this uh, uh, composite cell uh, state space. So then we can analyze individual trajectories. So here I show you a typical example. So we have a cell and the yellow is the Vimington. So the two day long uh, with TGI beta treatment, cell changes the shape um, and also Vimington change. And this is the same thing, this is the morphology and this is the trajectory. This high dimensional trajectory. Here I show you only two a leading coordinates, right? Morphology PC1 and uh, Vimington uh, PC1. So we got the individual trajectories. And we, uh, yeah, that been, yeah, we have many trajectories. Here are two typical ones. So you see um, this one. Uh, you see that first it goes Vimington uh, uh, change, uh, then this morphology change. 
Well, this one morphology by meeting they change together. So um, we analyze all the uh, trajectory that undergo EMT. So we do this way. We use a dynamic time warping kind of to class them. The dynamic time warping is algorithm for uh, lin uh, uh, time series analysis. Try to quantify uh, the similarity between two trajectories. Then by using some distance, then you see the two uh, the trajectory indeed separate into two clusters. Um, so here I want to point out, you know. So here, when we talk about protein uh, molecule over the cell, you see they're very different. But uh, if we use the, you know, uh, both are dynamical systems, right? So they have similar uh, representation. Therefore, we can do have similar analysis. Uh, specifically, here we, you know, ray theories have been a central theme in physics chemistry. And there's a classical review paper. People, you can go to see the, you know, about the, the ray theories. Uh, and here, um, what I show you here is uh, you see, uh, in the state space, you have a region, we define the reactant for the initial stage and the final stage. So we ask, um, starting from this initial stage, the launch trajectories, they can either go back, that's the non-reactive trajectories, or you can go end to the, uh, to the final stage, it's called the reactive trajectory. They form an ensemble of transition paths that you can do further analysis, I'll talk about uh, soon. So um, you see, um, when we study a chemical reaction, I always dream, okay, there's one day we can really visual, uh, vi visualize those chemical reactions in atomistic detail uh, in real time, but we know it's very difficult. You only can see uh, through uh, molecular dynamic simulations. But here in cell, it's much bigger, dynamic much slower, Actually, even my lab, we can easily get this uh, long time um, uh, trajectories. So in reef theory, a central uh, concept is called the reaction coordinates. This uh, describes the progression of a transition process, as I just mentioned, as well as the connect the barrier. So let's apply this concept in, to analyze our data. Um, from a transition path theory, what they say, we have region reactant, uh, region products, so we know there are infinite number of paths connect them. So each path can have a, a weight. So what is a, you know, a characterized this action. So this is essentially a path integral formulation. There are lots of treatments. I just point out one by Parisi. Um, this is a very concise treatment in his uh, very uh, known textbook. Um, so those paths, they typically form a reaction tube. So the center of a reaction tube can often can be a good uh, uh, selection, a good choice of reaction coordinates. So this is the essence of this called uh, finite temperature string method in chemical physics. So we uh, adopt this methods in to analyzing our uh, our data. So the idea is this: you you see uh, in this uh, state space, we uh, first have a trial of those reaction coordinates by uh, a, a array of points. Those points divide the space into individual Veroni cells. Then the data points will be assigned to individual Veroni cells. We use an iterative process, try to match the centroid of these data points within each Veroni cell to the corresponding, um, uh, 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 the, this uh, reaction coordinate point. So this is a, 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 the you know, actual formula we use, uh, but the idea is just what I described. So from there, we can reconstruct the reaction coordinates from our data. So you see there are two paths that was show, shown in this uh, three-dimensional feature space. And the show here, you see the individual trajectory indeed that just fluctuate around those uh, paths. Furthermore, because we have lifestyle imaging, we can now have X, we can have the X and T, right? So then we can try to explain the governing equation. Let's take the answer that we have uh, this type of governing equations. Then we know equivalent, this long term equation can be represented by this partial differential equations. And this J is defined this way. And, and the stratonology interpretation will given by the F, right? Uh, well, if eta will give actual term. So this immediately tell us what uh, um, an algorithm we can use to uh, get F function from the data. So this is what we do. So to make life easier, let's just say we want to get the, the uh, equation uh, project along this reaction coordinates. Uh, so um, 
So then this answer has become this, because even if this is a, a out of equilibrium, we can always, always for this 1D case, define a, a pseudo potential, scalar potential. And so the algorithm like this, right? So you, um, so this is, um, you know, the background of the data. If you zoom in, you see each data points will also have a, a vector represented velocity. We can calculate the, the velocity uh, components along this reaction coordinates, the tangent direction. Then, so for each Veroni cell, we uh, do the average of this quantity. So that gives us a D phi ds. Then we integrate over to get this pseudo potential we generate from the true data. So this is what we get. Uh, we know initially the epithelial cell is a, uh, is a tractor. And then when we add the TJ beta, and for two, both two directions, we see this uh, pseudo potential reconstructed from data. See the original uh, attractor uh, got destabilized and there's new attractor. And the interesting here is this one in the very first pathway. So you see there's a flat, quite flat region. So this kind of remnant of the original uh, epithelial attractor. And indeed, if we decrease TJ beta concentration, then this remnant become clear. Even you see some little barrier. Actually, uh, my postdoc, uh, he, he, he told me, he thought I found something very surprise, very, very hard to understand. Because uh, when one nanogram uh, millimeter TDI beta I have this concerted trajectory dominant. But with four nanogram millimeter, we have this Vimington uh, trajectory dominant. So um, what happens? So uh, this is uh, uh, relatively, uh, well, let's say this is a, uh, um, just like you have blind people, they try to reconstruct, uh, figure out how an elephant looks by touching different parts. We put them together, then we can end up a, a very uh, um, clear mechanistic uh, explanation. Now, so here I just use a metaphorical potential uh, system to, to illustrate it. That is, uh, let's say we originally have uh, this E attractor, uh, then we add the TJ beta, there's new attractor appears also separated by this uh, unstable point and two saddle points. Then we increase TJ beta first saddle node bifurcation. Uh, you have this destabilized E attractor, you have this pathway becomes uh, easy to go. Then for the increase TJ beta concentration, you have another saddle node bifurcation. And so this is the same picture you uh, again using the metaphoric uh, potential to illustrate how this TJ beta can change the whole landscape of the system. So I'll come back to this later uh, soon, but I one point uh, emphasize this, you see, this is a very cheap experiment, but if we really uh, quantify the data in the framework of uh, 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 dynamic system theory, we can have a deep mechanistic insight. So now I talk about this X is in, in this uh, collective uh, um, feature space. So in the parallel, my lab, uh, have done uh, in uh, collaboration with uh, Jonathan Westland lab. It's done by uh, Xiao Jie Chu uh, and uh, my student Yan Zhang. So we look at this. We also, similar idea, want to reconstruct down equation, but from single cell R6 data. So there you really only have a snapshot, but you can also have this uh, gene expression. Actually means genome-wide gene expression and at the activity is uh, instant uh, velocity. So we also work out a way we can learn this nonlinear multidimensional genome-wide vector function. Okay, but this is not the focus of today's talk. The key thing is that my student, Sophia, she used the method analyzing this set of uh, MCF10A cell uh, treated with TDI beta, which I also undergo EMT. So what she found is this, with TDI beta, zero TDI beta, you see this epithelial attractor. And when we have TGI beta, uh, then uh, you see there's new attractor peers. You can see these unstable points, this uh, separatrix, saddle points. And you, you can clearly see there are two possible paths. And when we add t more TGI beta, you see uh, this uh, uh, E attractor kind of destabilized. This uh, saddle point also is here. You see there's a, a continuous student line from here to, to the new attractor, while there's still another uh, set of point uh, at this country is still, still there. So you see, we, we have two different, totally different uh, cell line, different uh, uh, methods. We cannot reach the same picture. Uh, last year, a number of EMT researchers, including myself, we suggest that it is possible. 
that the multiple alternative paths can operate to enable an epithelial cell growth at once towards a mass chemo state. And now here we are going to show you, we, we uh, really demonstrated it experimentally. Um, so here, let's go back to see the original picture I said that we can math uh, mathematically, um, there are two basic mechanisms for, uh, for this uh, stable fixed point to uh, convert, be destabilized. One is the pitch four bifurcation, the other is the null bifurcation. So there's fundamental difference between these two is that for pitch fork, you, uh, the original one destabilize, then the system can go to uh, multiple direction, possible two ways. But for this one, set not by protein, it's kind of hand over hand mechanism. So you see this original attractor destabilize only along one direction and all other degree freedom still uh, direction are still stable. So the system uh, has a directional destabilization. So I see there's a fundamental difference and may have some uh, biological implication. Um, so I think I'll just skip at this part. Uh, then, uh, yeah, come to, to uh, so I just describe what we have done recently. And what we're trying to do now is we want to further extend that study. So we now we uh, know uh, with more data, hopefully you can reconstruct whole dynamical manifold, the Riemann uh, manifold. Uh, of this uh, um, in, in from our lifetime imaging data and got those vector fields. So we can compare, hopefully we can compare directly with, uh, with those uh, uh, single cell R-seq, uh, uh, contract from single cell R-seq uh, data. Um, so we are talking about a very complex system. We know we have a many degree freedom uh, with a ma a possibly strong coupling between them, but a limitation is a co the de uh, degree freedom we can observe limited. We have broad dynamical spectrum with, uh, without time scale separation and also the driven system. So uh, there are lots of complexity and uh, also demonstrated here is that say, um, suppose in the whole space you have observable hidden variable that separate, you know, define the system in two attractors, but okay, only have one observable. Then I was in the project on this that induced a lot of complexity at different contexts. We talk about something uh, related like this, uh, a new disorder, quantum disorder in, in, in physics. Well, in chemistry, uh, they we typically use different uh, terms, the same thing for dynamic disorder, static disorder. Well, in cell biology, people thought the cell cell heterogeneity for things. So there are a lot of uh, interesting things uh, we can study with this quantitative approach. Um, so with this, I already uh, mentioned the, uh, you know, show the picture to people, students, uh, how that they have done research. There's a lot of uh, collaborations for the lifestyle imaging mainly done by my lab and my colleague Simon and also uh, ATCC, we go, uh, and, and uh, for, for the uh, project I didn't really talk about, that's in collaboration with Jonathan, my colleague Yvette Bahar, uh, VG, Eric Lander from Broad Institute. And uh, uh, also uh, people from uh, Chan, Zach Borg, uh, Hub. And also for the last parts, uh, uh, the data is from um, a colleague Kazu uh, from Reichen. So uh, I think we'll stop here. By the way, I think that my last day, uh, slide is uh, for the uh, next March meeting, um, uh, Ji Yuan, Dr. Ji Yuan Li and I will organize a, a focus session on physical cell phase transitions. Um, please consider submitting abstracts. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you, Jinwa. And as a one of the uh, you know March meeting like DBIO program committee members, thank you for advertising your session. This is great. <laughs> so okay, now we have some time for uh, asking you questions. I'm going to read out some of the questions. So the first one is from Wai Zhao, and he or she's asking. Uh, they're asking what are the major original parameters, reaction coordinates in your model before doing principal component analysis? How many are there? Okay, um, so as I mentioned, uh, for that we do uh, lifestyle, in, when we like to lifestyle imaging, we have this morphology, we use active shape model, uh, that's give us uh, um, um, to represent the shape, and then it's the heretical features. So those are the original parameters uh, we use to define the reaction coordinate. Okay. Okay, so can you go to slide number 24? I think it's either slide number 23 or 24 for the next question. Okay, so 
Yeah, probably this, or it, it's either 23 or 24, right? Uh, so this is from Ralph Bunshu. And Ralph is asking, do you really get the same overall delta phi along the two different pathways? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. No, no. Um, this, you know, this is a problem for, because we're talking about, uh, uh, this is what that's called the pseudo potential, right? The, it's, a, it's really, uh, it's a, a, a out of equilibrium. Um, we, we don't have a, so it's not a conserved system that is a state function. This is not. I think that's a good question. Thank you. Okay, so I will ask one last question before we move on to the live part of the talk. This is from Gabor Balasi, and the question is, what is the degree of correlation between the movements of equidistant points on the cell boundary? Is the correlation cell or cell state specific? Uh, let me try to understand the, uh, the question. Correlation between movements of equidistant points. Um, so here I want to point one thing. Those, uh, um, I'm not. Let me let me see if I um, can make it clear. So we do not trace. Uh, we do not trace uh, those points. We cannot, uh, you know, trace those points over time. So what we do is uh, we we have. Uh, for every, uh, you know, every frame, we have the cell, right? First, we align them, you know, align them, that's what's shown here, align them. Then we just need to quantify. That's where now we place the points. Um, so um, we have certain rules, right? Because now we align them. Uh, we, we know uh, this rule we where to put one. Um, then uh, we, we, we have those points. Uh, that's, uh, so there, when you see um, if, I think the question is uh, the correlation between the movement equal that, you know, at the point of one in one frame, point one, uh, point one the next frame. But I think that's a good question. We haven't really checked on that. 